NIL Now with Lauren Sisler and Kevin Jones. If you want to learn more about name, image, and likeness, you need to go to the source. The NIL Now podcast from Headline Studio and Reddit highlights the biggest storylines with comments from key guests in the college and high school NIL space. NIL is not a cherry on top. It needs to be thought about as a part of these young men and women's future to, you know, further their careers. You should be able to leave college with something. Subscribe to NIL Now on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Hey, what's going on, Giants fans? Welcome to the latest episode of our Talk is Cheap Giants podcast from NJ Advanced Media, the Star Ledger, and NJ.com. Uh, Daryl Slater here with Bob Brookover. Uh, it is uh, Friday morning, the 21st of April right now, and about a month since we last spoke to you guys. And we wrapped up free agency in the Darren Waller trade last time around, and that was right before the NFL's owners' meetings in Arizona. And so really what's happened since we, we last spoke was um, the owners' meetings. Joe Shane and John Mara spoke there. They, you know, had some had some stuff to say, certainly about the Saquon Barkley situation most especially, and we'll get to that. Uh, and the Giants started their uh, mostly voluntary spring workouts uh, on Monday here a few days ago. Uh, that'll be you know, about a month from now. They'll do the OTAs practices and all that jazz. And um, Joe Shane yesterday here on Thursday did his pre-draft press conference. Not a lot from that. Uh, again, m- most notably the Saquon Barkley stuff. And that sort of has rendered the draft a little bit of an afterthought. But in addition to kind of talking Dexter Lawrence, Saquon Barkley, we'll get into draft preview. Obviously, that is coming up next uh, Thursday through Saturday. The Giants picking 25th in round one. And uh, yep. Yeah. And so there's plenty to, to discuss there. Uh, as we get into it here, Bob, how you doing? Hey, Daryl, how are you? Uh, how are you? Yeah, it's been a long, long time since we've talked, but not that much has happened or changed in terms of Saquon, uh, Dexter, and we don't know anymore who they're going to pick 25th than we did six weeks ago or what, however long ago it was, but four weeks ago. Uh, but neither do the Giants. They probably have a, their board more set up than they did then, but they're still at 25, still at the mercy of other teams. For sure, and I think we have a little bit of clarity on the, their positions of need. I believe, I can't recall when John Feliciano officially left, probably after we last talked, but we'll get into the positions of need and the draft prognostications and all that good stuff in a bit. We'll start here with the most notable things, that's Saquon Barkley. So, the bottom line here with this situation, uh, nothing has changed, as Joe Shane, Shane said, since the NFL owners' meetings. That was, you know, three, four weeks ago. So here's the thumbnail situation of where they're at. Um, there is no contract offer on the table for Saquon Barkley. Uh, Joe Shane really isn't thinking about it right now because he's focused on the draft, as as you know, as he should be, because there really is no deadline for this until July 17th. We all know a franchise tag deadline. In the meantime, Saquon Barkley is frustrated. He is not signed his franchise tag, so he's not under contract, so he can't even show up at anything technically. Um, essentially, he's refusing to, uh, but you know, by not signing the tag, he's refusing to, to show up, which is not really a big deal at all in the spring, including the mandatory minicamp. These are informal practices. Um, where it does become a big deal uh, is – especially because Joe Shane has said he's comfortable with Saquon Barkley playing on the, on the tag this year on a one-year deal. Um, when it does become a big deal is after the 17th. So if he still hasn't signed his tag by the start of camp, which is about a week and a half after the 17th, what then? Um, and that's when the drama could really crank up. We don't know. I mean, maybe he just go ahead. He just signs his tag here soon. They don't reach an agreement. He plays out the year on a one-year deal, but there's a possibility certainly of, of this standoff getting pretty icy. There is, um, and and I'll I'll answer your question by throwing another question back at you. What, in your mind, is Saquon's value behind being a Pro Bowl, Pro Bowl, one of the top five to ten running backs in the NFL? What is his value to the Giants um, beyond that, and 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 how much should the Giants look at that and consider that as their you know, standing firm on what they have out there right now, which is the franchise tag of ten point oh nine million. Oh, you mean just like his value in terms of being a good locker room guy and stuff? Yes, locker room guy, com- good community guy, uh, those things. What, what, how should they value that? Um, and and how much do you think they value that? I think they do, and I think they should. But 
I don't think they do nor should value that in an outsized way. Um, look, I mean, yeah, he's a good locker room leader. He's a, he's, he's by all accounts, a solid citizen. And so, but there are a lot of guys in there who are like that. Um, that's true, know, but he's, he probably has more to deal with it more than, than others because of his stature on the, on the team. Sure. You know, yeah. yeah. I give him a lot of credit for being readily available. Um, you know, there's some t- some talk about you know Dan- Daniel Jones doesn't really like that part of it, although he's available every day too. Um, but you're you know if you if you if you had to say okay, I got to go to the Daniel Jones or Saquon Barkley today to get something for a story or you know or something about a situation's going on, you're probably going to go to Saquon because your, your chances of getting something better are there. <laughs> sure, uh, and, 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 and there's value to that too. Yes. He's a good representative for for the team and the in the franchise. Um, but you know the the issue. Uh, what I would point out is he he brought this on himself. I mean, he and his agent Kim Miali they they overplayed their hand here. They overestimated his value. They did not take the contract offer that was offered during the season. And I think one thing worth pointing out is one one thing that's never been leaked. And by leaked, I mean Saquon's agent leaking this to reporters uh, who. Um, let's just say tend to be sympathetic towards Saquon's angle um, is the guaranteed money that the giants offered in that contract. And that matters, but, but let's look at it like this. If the giants really super lowballed this guy with that offer during the year, it, um, it would have been out there. It would have been out there. So right. like, logically you can look at it and say they made him a, a fair and reasonable offer. He declined it because he wanted more, which is his right. The running back market cratered uh, and Barkley, most notably, his agent did not foresee the possibility. You know what what happened, which is they lock up Daniel Jones on the on the you know his, his contract, and they were able to tag fran- franchise tag Saquon Barkley. Look, this is Joe Shane's job. You know he took advantage of of the fact that Saquon Barkley and his agent overplayed their hand. What was he supposed to do? Like feel bad for him and then say, oh, you know what? Like like go ahead and hit the open market. Like what? What? Like no. Um, but the, the, look, he has to take, he has to own his share of the blame here. He can't, I understand he's frustrated about being tagged, but he brought this on himself to some degree. And so, I mean, so if you were Saquon, I'll, I'll, I'll keep asking questions. It's a lot easier to ask questions. Uh, <laughs> um, would, would you, would you fire, would you fire Kim Miali and, uh, and Rock Nation if you were Saquon? <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe they have a good, the, the things that we don't know are this, like they, they, seemingly have a good relationship right so there's some i'm sure some personal and professional fondness there um and they, they may and they we, we know they are because they have have relationships with the nfl on different things uh that the, the group itself um so maybe you know there's there's things and, and this is one of the things that john mara brought up on trying to convince saquon to stay with the giants is you know they're, they they may be able to get him things, especially in the New York area, um, that that other agents can't in terms of endorsements and and things like that, and appearances and you know speaking appearances and things like that. If you know, and and that's that's especially important after a career. You know, what, sure. what, I, yeah. I mean, I and that's what John, that was John Mara's point that if 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 Saquon is a giant for life. Um, you know, somebody like uh, Tiki Barber was a giant for life. There's a career out there in the New York market for you um, doing something for the rest of your life. I mean, I, I live in Philadelphia. I've seen it with players who weren't even stars. You know, the, the biggest star on the radio here is in Philadelphia. In Philadelphia is Ike Reese uh, in the market that I lived in. Um, you know, and he was a special teams uh, guy, you know, so those things happen. And for Saquon, they probably would happen, you know, in multiple things because he is such a good player and a, a person who's well liked in the in, in the New York market. Yeah, and, and for him, like I, I can totally see how like he's saying like, okay, yeah, that's great, but I want to win a championship and make money during my playing career, and the rest of that I'll worry about it later. I'm not thinking about that right now. And those, you know, those are his immediate priorities: winning and making money. I don't know, like, so the one thing we don't know here is like when you talk about maybe firing his agent is like. And we're just speculating here about all this stuff, but um, 
maybe he's the one who said turn the deal down, right? So she works for him, but like she can't go ahead and accept the deal if he's saying like, no, I don't want to. So let's be clear here. Like uh, Very true. Yep. He, he can say yes or no on all this because she is literally an agent for him. Like she's an, you know, an agent to make his decisions. And so that that's part of it. But the bottom line is um, Bar- Saquon Barkley is not a victim here. I mean, they made him and what seemingly is a reasonable contract offer and he turned it down. And so um, the, like, okay, so we now what now? I think that that's what we have to kind of pitch ahead well, here. The, the Saquon Barkley might not be a victim, but the, the longer this drags on, uh, the Giants could be a victim to this. <laughs> well, that's, that's, um, so that's what we can talk about. Like, so, uh, okay, so what now? Like the, the door is ajar to him because he hasn't signed the tag skipping some or a lot of training camp because he's not under contract. He can't be fined. Um, We don't know if he's going to do that. We don't know if he's thinking about doing that. Um, But, but then it becomes like, okay, could he skip regular season games? And like, so let's assess those possibilities. Like what, where do you, what do you make of it? I don't think he will. I mean, you you don't want to leave $10 million, $10.1 million essentially on the, on the table and, and not, not play for that money just doesn't seem like the the right move. But Le'Veon Bell is the I think the most recent guy to do it. Certainly most recent running back. It didn't work out well for him. Um, you know, long long time ago, Emmett Smith did it. it. It I don't know if it worked out for him or not financially. Obviously, he came back, played well. The Cowboys went on and won a Super Bowl. So from that sense, and he still made lots of money. Um, you know, I I don't know. I can't see him doing that. I just can't um, fathom him doing that. Um, but if he's if he wants to be hard nosed about it, he can take it right up to that point and say, "All right, finally on July seventeenth, I'll, I'll do this." Or or he can take it into training camp, and say, "You know what? I I don't feel like going through those hot days till uh, in the middle of August. Um, you know, I'll wait till August twentieth to do it." Would that hurt him as a player? I don't know. I, you know. I'm sure there are studies done about players holding out or missing time and, you know, how, how often they're injured compared to, but, you know, to me still, that's a lot of time, just a, a luck of the draw, um, especially yeah. in the day and age when it's so easy to have a personal trainer and keep yourself in shape year round. And so I don't, you know, there, he can take this for a long time if he really wants to and, and, and play hardball. Um, and he, he, it doesn't mean he's going to get his money, but he can cause a lot of misery. Uh, so, and how how angry is he? That's a, that's basically what it comes down to. How angry is he that, um, you know, I'm sure there's a part of him say, hey, you offered me this. I, I thought you would keep that deal on the table, you know, no matter what. Yeah, um, that, that's true too. They yanked the contract. And Joe Shane publicly said he yanked the contract, which to me is like a little bit, I mean, I'm all for a guy saying what's on his mind and everything it felt a little bit like rubbing it in. Right. Right. Joe, Joey, I mean, you could, you could see that yesterday had his, his draft news conference, which, which essentially became his Saquon news conference. Um, you know, that he is on, uh, on edge and not, not thrilled with what's going on here because he's basically answering multiple questions about um, he's trying to get ready for the draft and answering multiple, multiple questions about a guy who's unhappy on his team with the same answer over and over again, nothing has changed. Yeah. But to me, it's like, whatever for Joe, look, the guy has, doesn't really have to talk to the media that much for a year. So sit there. No, 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 no I, I agree, but I'm just saying that that showed his, that showed right. his, uh, that, that it, it's under his skin some, you know? Oh, for sure. And he's like, look, I haven't talked to him. I haven't talked to him. Okay. So they're not talking at all. And, and nor, nor do they have to be talking or negotiating. And so, um, like we said, it's like it's the seventeenth of July is what really matters. So Barkley could take it all the way up till then, um, and really it's it's training camp. So like Barkley could take it to the eve of training camp, and he signs his tag and he shows up at camp, and and honestly, like there's really no impact except for him maybe still being frustrated. Right, and um, the, the other thing you see is as Shane said, they're they're knee deep in the draft right now. Yeah, maybe when the draft's over, his focus turns more to Saquon and getting, getting, uh, we haven't even talked about Dexter getting an extension for Dexter. Maybe after those two things happen, the focus goes much harder on those two things. 
Yeah, and I, I asked him yesterday, like, do you have a like a new contract offer in mind? Obviously, you yanked the contract offer that was what twelve to twelve and a half million a year, and we don't know the guaranteed money uh, on that. But is there a new one? Like, would you make a new one? Or are you just are you just gonna say, nah, play it, play out the year on the tag? We don't know where his head's at with that, and it sounds like he hasn't really thought about it yet either. Um, but like to me, so okay, so like let's just say. Let's just say he, you know, July seventeenth comes and goes, and there's no contract, which I think is at this point really possible, um, even though it's three months out. About, um, and then he doesn't sign the tag, um, which leaves open the possibility of skipping some camp. Like, obviously, like if he skips a few days or a couple weeks of camp, like, yeah, it's drama, but um, does it really affect things from the Giants or Barkley that much? Probably not. Um, but the longer it goes, yeah, the Giants need him on the field, but he needs to be on the field too. Like, I, so, so there's no, for me, like there's once July 17th comes and goes, the word holdout does not apply because he's not holding out for anything. There's nothing more he can get other than the one year deal. Right. So it, it's not, a, it's not a holdout. Right. He, he's staying away out of spite, it, literally out of spite. Um, right. And also to preserve his body. Uh, you know, you think like Le'Veon Bell did, but, not only did the Le'Veon Bell situation not work out five years ago, cautionary tale and all that, Le'Veon Bell was a better and more productive player in the years before that situation than Saquon Barkley's been, period. Yeah. And then he yeah. came back and his career was over. <laughs> and he came, yeah, right. So in, in multiple ways, it's not a comparable situation. It was the second straight year. Bell had been tagged. It would be insane. And I'm not saying Barkley's even thinking about this. It would be a terrible decision for him to skip regular season games, okay? What exactly is he going to be showing teams – by doing that, does he think that, you know, doing that again, and this is kind of like a straw man thing. Cause we don't know where his head's at. Uh, does he think that like doing that would, um, you know, it's all hypothetical, but would, uh, you know, would that encourage teams to pay him big money next year? No, the running back market's a disaster. This guy's yeah. had one good year since his injury. Like, so right. he needs, I mean, to get the money he wants, he needs to go out and have an even better right. year. And then, and then get an insurance from the Giants, which they, you know, they won't give them a, a written insurance, but you know, kind of come to an agreement here. Hey, I'm going to come back if you agree not to tag me again next year, so I can go test the market. You know, so. yeah, he need right, and he needs to play and play well in a prove it year. He's auditioning for money. He needs to go out and audition. Staying away would not be the answer. So, for as much as we can sit here and say, "Oh, the Giants need him. They need him. They he needs to play. He needs to play. Period." Like it's this is not, you know, this is not like. There, he has no leverage. Period. The guy has no leverage. Like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump to a draft thing here, just because he's, and I've written about it, but uh, just because it, it, it impacts this situation. So, Bijan Robinson falls to number 25 on the board. Um, what do you do? Do you take him? And do you take him? And really, I mean, that's that might be the end for. For Saquon, because now they've not only you're not only getting not getting the contract you want, you're also you vote. They've also drafted your replacement, essentially. I mean, you know, you know, this is probably going to almost certainly uh, going to be your last year in New York. Uh, they, they've got a new star in town. And, you know, if 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 it's you know, it's it's always hype until the guy proves himself. But if this guy lives up to the hype. He might be a better version of Saquon Barkley that you get at number 25 in the draft. And uh, as I've written, the Giants cho choose, they can rescind that tag. And all of a sudden, they got $10 million to play around with here. And there's some guys uh, out on the market still that depth wise could certainly help you. Uh, and maybe even starting role wise could help you. Um, obviously, the, 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 the con to that is. You're not going to be drafting a position of need, yeah. um, but just your thoughts if you, if you did that. It's a fascinating possibility for all the reasons you brought up. Um, I, 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 and again, it really depends on who's there, and it, well, obviously if he's there, and then also who else is there. But I, I would say no, just generally speaking, because um, again, you have all these other areas in need. You can play out the year with a really good proven running back in Saquon Barkley. And you know what? Like, even if he – and then you're, you're you're trying to accomplish something this year, right? And even if he walks next year in free agency, you're looking at probably getting a comp pick, uh, depending on, again, the comp pick formula is based on who you bring in versus who you, who leaves in free agency. But um, that's where I kind of fall on it. Like, just let him play out the year. Let it see how it goes. Um, address another position there. Uh, 
so I, I wouldn't generally speaking. Um, but there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of what ifs that could point to it. Why it could work. I think. Yeah. Why yeah. It could be a reasonable decision. Right. To me, the interesting part also is just that cap money. It frees up. That's a lot of cap money yeah. to have right now at this time of year. Big um, domino. That's a big domino. Um, and we'll kind of shift gears. And speaking of cap money, and, and and he's kind of flown under the radar, Dexter Lawrence has because of the nature of the Saquon Barkley situation. So Dexter Lawrence, a little bit more cut and dried and standard here. Um, he's got a $12.4 million cap number on the fifth year option coming up. That would obviously be lowered uh, by whatever long-term contract he signs. So his is a bit higher than the Barkley number at $10 million. Um, but So this is all fairly standard posturing and negotiations. Player stays away during the voluntary portion of the spring. He's under contract. So for Dexter Lawrence, the the more interesting part comes up in mid-June and not mid-July is does he skip the mini camp at Dare the Giants to find him? Uh, He wants a new contract. It's normal for these guys to stay away. He deserves a new contract. He's a great player. He's a foundational player. There's no way they're going to let him go into the fifth-year option, final year of his rookie deal. He's going to, right, he's going to get a new contract this offseason. Uh, the, the question is just where does the money fall and how does it compare to Jeffrey Simmons, uh, the money that he got already, and also to whatever Quinn and Williams gets uh, with the Jets. Yeah, and the, the other guy in there is Chris Jones, who supposedly yeah. is going to get a deal with from the Chiefs. But it, it, it was an interesting – it's a fascinating – I looked at that whole rookie class. There's like – there was a record six defensive tackles taken in that rookie class, and five of them right now want new deals. Uh, I don't think Ed Oliver in Buffalo is going to get one. He was the number nine overall. Uh, but Saquon, or wait, Saquon, Dexter is, um, you know, certainly him and Quinn Williams are certainly at the top of that list. Uh, and I think you could you could throw him, those two, and Jeffrey Simmons in a, into a bucket and pull one out, and you'd be, you know, whoever the general manager was would be thrilled whichever one they pull out. It wouldn't, it wouldn't really matter. So I, you know, has Jeffrey Limit, Simmons set the the top end of the market for the? Well, it's the, it's not the top end because Aaron Donald was the top end and way above all of them. But you know, I think I think he has. Um, and if the Giants go just north of that, they're going to have a deal with him. Uh, same with the Jets. Uh, I don't know how much the agents want to, you know, m- much more than that, but. I can't see them any of them getting much more than what Simmons got, which was a terrific deal. Um, you know, I guess it's twenty three point five average deal, um, twenty three point five million average deal. So, you know, it's like as you said, it's going to get done. Uh, it doesn't sound like this is a big dispute. It didn't. Joe Shane didn't seem to be the least bit upset that. Uh, Dexter has chosen not to come to these voluntary, as he put it, voluntary uh, workouts. Uh, said right up front, "I'm I'm still negotiating. We're in deep deep in the draft, so that that leads me to believe when the draft is over, they'll get deeper into the talks and 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 get something done. So it, it, it's not a big deal at this point. It's all a matter of what are the details going to be when when the ink dries on his contract." Yeah, and if you look at the Simmons contract, just kind of in the weeds of it, um, in terms of the guaranteed money, he basically got, you know, a three-year, sixty million dollar deal, um, in terms of what, when they can get out of the contract. Um, yeah, he got you know four years, ninety-four, but it's three sixty sixty million. Um, guaranteed, right? Although, yeah. Although, although with those guys, I, yeah, I think there's probably a pretty good chance he finishes it out, but we'll see. Yeah, um, and and at twenty-three and a half a year. Um, it's really four years tacked onto the fifth year option. So he, he's under contract through 2027. It looks like here. Um, right. so, but the bottom line is yes, I think Dexter Lawrence will get something similar, if not a bit North of that and probably Quentin Williams too. And the, they're, like you said, they're very comparable players. No one's getting Aaron Donald money. Um, obviously for various reasons, one of which is that none of these guys are as proven as Aaron Donald, who is one of the best players in the history of the NFL. Um, and uh yeah, no, I think that the, the the Dexter Lawrence situation is certainly much less complex than Saquon Barkley's. Um, obviously, they want to have Dexter Lawrence around. He's going to be around. And um, the question just becomes how much money he gets. So he's staying away. Also, during the voluntary portion, we'll, we'll see what happens in mid-June uh, when the mandatory minicamp rolls around. Um, 
maybe they have a deal by then. Maybe they don't. And he shows up and maybe they don't. And he stays away and he says, go ahead and find me. Um, so that'll be a, that'll be a pretty interesting situation. Obviously not as much drama as Saquon Barkley, um, uh, just because it's pretty clear that Dexter Lawrence is there's there's not a lot of debate about whether he's worth keeping, right? And there's, there's, there's <laughs> to me, that's the, one of the funniest things about this entire, both with Saquon and and Dexter. Um, you know, they they feel like they're both feel players feel like they're better value than they're being paid right now, and Joe Shane agrees with them both because you you know with with. The state county showed it by making an offer north of what he's yep. the, the tag. And with Dexter, he said over and over again, oh, yeah, we need to do a new deal with him. Uh, that, that's an unusual situation where the general manager says, yes, I agree. Or, you know, essentially he's saying, yes, I agree. But two, he's got two guys holding out. Um, interesting twist to the whole thing. For sure. Um, and so we'll switch pin pivot, I guess, to the draft. And it's, again, the draft's a little bit of an afterthought, right? Because of the Barkley drama, because of the Dexter Lawrence, I wouldn't even call it drama, but the continued Dexter Lawrence not getting a contract. That's a clunky way of putting it. Uh, but and let's, also because they're picking 25th, 25th, <laughs> but let's be, let's be real here. I mean, this roster still needs work. I mean, this team got obliterated by the Eagles in, in the divisional round. They have a lot of weaknesses, a lot of holes, even coming out of free agency. You know, everyone knows most obviously like outside receiver, uh, number two cornerback and, you know, Dory Jackson there entering the final year of his deal too. So cornerback in general, uh, left guard is a question mark. Center is an even bigger question mark than left guard. So those would be the, the obvious areas that everyone knows. Um, and you don't then, believe Joe Shane when he says he's very comfortable with his 12 offensive linemen? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can't like put him in a blender and make us one starting center out of 12 guys. Right. So like, uh, I'm sorry, but I'm not sold on Ben Bredesen playing center mostly because he's never actually really played center in a game before. I don't even think he has at all. So yeah, I, I wonder if any of the, that is influenced by the, I mean, in, John Feliciano wasn't really a center either. And oh. not that he was a great one, but he, he certainly got them through the season and got, it was the center who got them to the playoffs. So, a vet, though, you know, and Bredesen's a little younger, so but he has experience, so he right. does. He, I mean, I you know, I've talked to Bredesen enough to know that he's he will take the uh challenge seriously if he, if that's what they put in front of him. Uh, and he did, and he he was, in, in my opinion, he was at you know, if you look at the whole season. And this is even even though he was sharing time at the end with Nick Gates, and maybe I don't know, I don't know who graded better, but he was their best left guard last year. Uh, so it, 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 having said that, that's what I would want him to do again this year. He was yes. pretty good at it. Maybe there's a chance he, good chance he gets even better at it. And in his second year as a as the starting left guard, um, you know, and given given the opportunity to win that job entirely, and then I would go get my center in the draft. So that's what I would do. Totally sure. reasonable. And I think, you know, Bredesen did play the most snaps at center more than Nick Gates last year. So it's not like the Giants really lost their starting left guard in Nick Gates. I mean, because Bredesen played more. The question then becomes like, if you move Bredesen to center, then you probably perhaps have to play Joshua Zudu, a left guard, and he was not good last year as a rookie. Um, so there's a lot of things here. And then the the other thing hovering over this draft is Joe Shane, his, his margin for error or whatever is he's not going to get as many swings. You want to take as many swings as possible in the draft. They did have the extra third rounder. They traded it to the Raiders through Darren Waller. So now it's one pick in each of the first three rounds, a little bit more you know clean and uniform there. Um, albeit not as preferable for a GM. Um, but so w- the question becomes, well, what do they do? So, you know, Tom McShane, Mel Kuyper did a three round mock. We can kind of riff off that a little bit just uh, because it's sort of an interesting simulation from a, guy, a couple of guys who know a few things. So here's what they had them doing. Um, they had the Giants picking Deontay uh, Banks, the cornerback from Maryland at 25 and passing on Quinton Johnston, who goes with the next pick. Um, and we can circle back and revisit a little bit around one, but what they had them doing in round two at 57 was John Michael Schmitz, the center from Minnesota, I think entirely possible. And then you're thinking, Oh gee, no receiver yet. Uh, 89 in round three, their lone third round pick Kuiper McShay had him going with Nathaniel Dell five, eight uh, receiver from Houston, which uh, you know, a little bit of redundancy there with Wandale Robinson, but he's coming off the ACL. Uh, but we can, we can kind of take those one by one and address them broadly. Um, you know, there's an, any number of ways that the, that this 
first round could unfold. But at least in in this particular uh, simulation, you know, a couple of the obvious cornerbacks are gone: Devin Witherspoon, Christian Gonzalez, and then just going down the list in terms of a Jackson Smith and Jiba uh, is gone as well. Um, I'm just quickly scrolling here. Zay Flowers is gone. Um, and Jordan Addison is gone as well at 21. Emmanuel Forbes, another good cornerback, is gone at 22. And Joey Porter Jr., uh, gone at 23. So that's where the Giants are squeezed at 25. And they go with Deontay Banks in this thing while passing on Quinton Johnston. Um, I think it's probably a receiver or cornerback in round one. I, I, do you think they could draft – Schmitz in round one or where do you fall on everything I just rambled about? I, I, I don't think they, I think um, they wouldn't draft Smith in round one because I, I think the feeling is, uh, you know, and again, I'm an outsider looking in who I, I, I will say I've, I, I'm, I've read more about the draft than at any point in my life this year. <laughs> um, and I, I just reading, it seems like, a center of good value will be available. Uh, um, I don't want to pronounce his name right. Luke Weipler. He's, he's a, I, don't, I th- think that's how yeah. you pronounce it from Ohio state. And he's a, he's a local kid too. Um, he's, yeah, I think he played at Bosco. Um, I, I think that's right. But he played at St. Joe's. St. Yeah. Joe's. St. Joe's Montfield. I'm sorry. Um, so he's, he, he's supposed to be available. Uh, the, and the Wisconsin Tipman is, could be available. So one of those three, and, and Schmitz might even uh, be available too, too, as he is in this in this um, in this mock. So I think you, you got one of those three. So I don't think they'll pick uh, Schmitz at one. Um, I you know there's I think this is one of the mocks you laid out of the seven round mocks you know I, I don't know if Osiris Torrance was from Florida he was more of a guard was he on that board with uh, Kuiper and they have him going thirty fifth to the Colts okay I that's one of the things like you know I and again I was an outsider for, in, in Philadelphia looking at this from. Uh, 90 miles away when the Giants were at their best, both, both errors of them winning their two Super Bowls in, in a span of a few years. Um, I just remember them having obviously great defensive lines, Lawrence Taylor, Michael Strahan, but also having great offensive lines. Um, you already have that at left tackle with Andrew Thomas, you know, bringing, the, bringing two guys in this draft at the top of the draft, um, you know, a starter and an interior guy, and, and you got the makings of a pretty good offensive line going, jumping up a lot from being considered one of the worst. I think you could be considered one of the best. And especially when you factor in what Joe Shane, he, he says he feels comfortable with the depth of what they have all on the offensive line right now. Hey, well, you know what? At some point in the year, you're going to need that depth, as we saw last year. Um, so I, I wouldn't be adverse to drafting two offensive linemen right at the top uh, and then start feeling – filling uh, the cornerback wide receiver thing from there. You know, I, I wouldn't think that was a bad move, an awful move. Yeah, it does. You know, they have to do a lot of self-scouting here and see how they feel about Cordell Flott playing outside and Nick McLeod, who got a considerable amount of time last year. But um, cornerback is one of the hardest positions to play for a rookie. Um, we've seen it. It really is. I mean, it's the quarterback. It's the quarterback of the defense, really. I mean, in terms of difficulty, it's it's a tough position to play. Now, Sauce Gardner went out and just was awesome last year, uh, but there's not. I don't. I think the consensus in this draft. It's, it's don't do a lot of things right, but they can draft some cornerbacks, can't they? Yeah, yeah. Well, D. Milner would would beg to differ, but uh, <laughs> uh, they they um. But yeah, Revis. I'll, give you, I'll give you Revis and every fifteen years, right? They get Revis and and, and Sauce Gardner. Um, but there's not a Sauce Gardner in this draft. It doesn't seem. Who the heck knows? We don't know. But um, no, until they go play, you don't know. Yeah, but but I think that there's a lot of pot. That, yeah, I think that the, the, the man, if they go offensive line, offensive line, that I think there would be a lot of Giants fans who would be, uh you know, their heads would explode over that. Uh, but I think pragmatically it, it could work. Um, it, a lot depends on how they feel about the current guys on their roster. And, and also like, um, you know, wh- 
can Darren Waller stay healthy because he's essentially a receiver. And so um, do you have to draft an outside receiver when you have, they have a ton of bodies in the receiver room, but no sure thing. Number one. And um, so, yeah, I think the one thing to remember about Joe Shane's offense and and then this particularly ties into the, the Dell um, projection in 89 there is, and he, he's a versatile guy. Um, he's played inside in the slot. He's played outside receiver. Um, so I'll just, you know, Kuiper has a good little blurb here. He had 199 catches Dell did over the past two years. I'm not saying they're going to draft this, but this, this guy, but this underscores how Brian Dable's offense, you know, embraces versatility. Uh, and 61 of those 199 came when he was in wide, right. And 60 came in the slot on the left side of the field. So he's, he's, he's lined up on both sides of the field in the slot and outside. He has a funny nickname, this kid tank. Cause he's, you know, he's five, eight, get it. Uh, he's not a tank, uh, but they call him that. Um, so, yeah, yards after catch ability. Uh, so there's a lot to like. But, but again, they just drafted Wandale Robinson last year. So right. like, they, well, I'm going to go back to the time, the last time, the last team to draft two offensive linemen in, in, with their first two picks was the Falcons. Um, they they got a um, – they get Cal Caleb McCary with the 31st pick and Chris Lindstrom with the four, 14th overall pick. Uh, Lindstrom was the highest rated guy at, at right guard of, at, with a 95 grade pro football focus out of a 95 grade, the highest grade of any player in the whole NFL last year. They got him mm-hmm. at 14th. Uh, and Mc, McGarry was the 31st pick. He's been a starter. Th- this was in the 2019 draft. Um, he's been a starter every year. Uh, played every game it, it, and was rated the, the fourth rate highest rated tackle um, last season. Um, so you, you get those two guys, but let's go back in Giants history to 1988 and 1989. So in 88, um, they took Eric Moore from Indiana with the 10th overall pick and Jumbo Elliott from Michigan in the second round. They were both starters on their Super Bowl team a year later, uh, and, or no, no I'm, I'm not not a year later, two years later, I guess it was. Yeah, ninety, uh, and then eighty nine, they took um, Bob Bob Cratch, I think is the name. Let's see, yes, he's actually Bob. related to uh, what's that? <laughs> uh, he, he, I believe. No. He's- related to a, a guy who used to work the great james cratch are you oh work? is that right yeah i don't know i'll have to ask james how he's related but james uh used oh. to work for, you know at the ledger and nj.com oh anyway. that's great I, yeah he predates me but i've seen the byline for sure <laughs> he, he, was guard, he was a guard for my they took in the third round in the first round they took us uh brian williams a center from minnesota who was a fascinating story because he didn't start he, – <laughs> You'd say, oh, he's a bust. He didn't start his first five years with the team. But the only reason he didn't start because he was playing behind Bart Oates. So finally, his sixth season, he started. And I think in his second season or his third season as a starter, he suffered an eye, like a debilitating eye injury that kept him out a year. Um, and he finally came back and started another two years. But he was a really good player who couldn't get on the field because of Bart Oates and then played really well for a few years and um, got hurt seriously, then came back from it. So had like a 10-year career with the Giants, even though he was only a starter for like four or five of them, so, which is very rare. Um, but twice they've done it since and, and it's, the last two times they've done it, it's worked out very well for him, probably getting way off track and doesn't really matter in terms of this draft. But to, just to show it's it's not a bad idea to sometimes p- picking two offensive linemen can really work out well for a team. Yeah, the draft is a crapshoot. So, but uh, if if I guess if they do do it, it's kind of conjures some memories of the '06 draft for the Jets, Brick Brick Ferguson at four, uh, and Nick Mangold at twenty nine. Granted, the Jet this isn't a four and twenty nine. This is like twenty five and or fifty seven. So not the right. same. But um, right. it can work. Um, but. Uh, in terms of other positions they could attack in, in the draft. Um, you know, I did a little blurb earlier this week about some of the visits the giants had and the p- prospects they met with. And granted, you know, the, as Joe Shane said, they're meeting and with some of these prospects and especially with the top 30 visits at, at their facility, you know, to rule out some guys too. So it doesn't mean they're, they're super interested in all these guys, but obviously 
uh, some of the takeaways coming out of those were, you know, mainly we'll go positions of need here. We already talked about the receiver situation, the cornerback situation, and then left guard slash center. Those would be the big three. Um, but just kind of running down the list a little bit here uh, as an offshoot of just interesting positions of, that they could address in no particular order. Uh, what, what about uh, what about a number three quarterback here? What, what, what's your sense on whether they could they could go in that <laughs> It's not going to be yeah. Henry Hooker, obviously. They brought him right. in. But, right. Uh, what about a late I, Like, I don't understand. Like, that visit seems weird to me that they brought brought him in at all. Um, I, I, like, I don't know what the purpose of that was. It, it wasn't to eliminate him because he's going to be eliminated by the, the time they make their pick. Um, you know, I, I, I think, yeah, you know, I, you watch what the 49ers did with the very last pick. Of the draft, um, I think um, in the fourth round last year, the the um, Patriots took Bailey Zappi, who is now in, in a conversation whether he should replace Mac Mac Jones. Like, and, and Bailey Zappi threw sixty two touchdown passes in his one year in the FBS with Western Kentucky. Uh, is to me, if a guy throws sixty two touchdown passes, I, and I have ten picks, and he's available in the sixth or seventh round, I'm taking him. You know, just to <clears throat> just to see what what a guy who threw sixty down two touchdown passes can do, um, you know. And I think the Giants should use one of their, you know, at least one of their three seventh round picks on a, on a guy. The, the the guy who interests me um, down that low is uh, Stetson Bennett. You know, they have a lot of boards have him maybe not even being drafted, but certainly not drafted till the seventh round. The guy, I think, went 29 and won the last two years and won two national championships. Uh, you know, that's that's the kind of leadership thing. Um, and, and that's one of the things people talk about. And Jalen Hurts was obviously a better talent than him. He went in the second round. But the, the, the intangible things about Jalen Hurts being a winner everywhere he went, and then he made himself into a better player. I don't know if Stetson Bennett has that. Probably, I'm sure he doesn't have that kind of <coughs> athletic ability. But... Hey, you know what? <laughs> there's this as as I said in the, st- the story I wrote today about a backup quarter, but there's, there's this story about a guy who fell to the sixth round and the Patriots took him. Um, and you know, <laughs> you might have heard his name, uh, but but you know, if I'm the Giants, I do do it. Although it seemed to me, it seemed yesterday like Joe Shane was lukewarm to the idea. You know that that didn't really wasn't really on his radar, but maybe he's just playing possum in that that regard. I think he got peeved about all the Saquon questions and he was just trying to give short answers to get the heck out of there. Um, that's, that's entirely possible. <laughs> Bennett's an interesting one. I mean, they, they, I think they need to draft an, a developmental quarterback, right? Because for a couple of reasons, well, they gave Daniel Jones a two-year contract, right? So like, but just I'll set that aside. They need a backup. Um, they're not going to have Tyrod Taylor as their backup probably past this year. So they got to figure out who their backup is going to be. Um, and so, you know, you have a hole there because Davis Webb, uh, is is gone now. Granted, they could stash Webb on the practice squad all year. You perhaps will have to carry a, an intriguing rookie. Now, granted, if he's a seventh round guy, maybe you could stash him uh, instead of carrying three quarterbacks. Um, but you know, having a developmental quarterback doesn't hurt. Bennett, who's you know on the shorter side, okay. The the interesting thing about him, like I wouldn't even classify him as developmental because the dude is really old. So I, yeah. I, I don't know whether where I'd fall in. He was born in October of ninety seven. Daniel Jones was born in May of 97. They're like yeah. the same age. <laughs> no, it's, it's crazy. crazy. There's a few. There's a few that COVID has done that to this draft yeah. where, where there's guys who, who, who play have played forever um, because they got at these extra years of eligibility, um, which is good for them. The, the, the other guy I really like in this draft is UCLA's Dorian Thompson Robinson. He was a five-year starter at UCLA um, who, who I don't think was very good when he started there. But he played five years under Chip Kelly, so obviously he's got some NFL insight from his head coach there. Mm-hmm. Uh, by last season, he was he was a very good quarterback. Um, so he, he's a guy who interests me, and you know he's a, he's a dual threat, which you know obviously both Tyrod Taylor and Daniel Jones are. So that's and I think that's the kind of thing that Brian I think Brian Dable does like to have a dual threat quarterback. 
for sure. And he's 23, so a little younger there. So that's an interesting possibility. Uh, obviously, quarterback's always going to be discussed. We talked the running back thing, just kind of going down this thing I wrote. Uh, we talked about the, the running backs, and B. John Robinson and Barkley, so you don't have to revisit that. What about another inside linebacker? I, I think another, a guy they've had in for, uh, I don't know if a visit or they talked to at some point, uh, it was Drew Sanders from Arkansas, who is uh, – Consider a really good blitzing inside linebacker, and uh, obviously Wink Martindale likes to blitz. So they they did obviously sign Bobby Okorake, uh, and he is going to be their middle linebacker. But really, at the other inside linebacker spots, like Jared Davis, so um, maybe draft an inside linebacker. I, yeah, I think somewhere along the uh, along the line, they're going to take an, an inside linebacker. Um... You know, maybe if the one they like is is a, I don't think they do. I don't think they do it in the first round. But maybe if the one if one they really like is available in the second round, it, it it's something you do because they're still, you know, I could see them drafting um, almost after the first round. I could see them drafting almost any, not not any position because offensive tackle is not not on the board. But I could see them drafting an interior lineman, a you know guard or center in the second round. Um, you know. An inside linebacker, certainly, even though you got Okoraki in this offseason, um, you know, an, an interior defensive lineman because you're, you you can never have enough of those guys, you know, and you'd like to be rotational at that position. Same same with the edge rushers. I think they still need, I think they still need more depth at edge rusher. Uh, and if you, you know, you, you can get a guy who you think you, you bring in your first year and he becomes part of the rotation, but become can become more than that and hey if he's the best guy you have you have on your board you do you do that you know there's and there's a there's a bunch of guys second round inside linebackers i think cedric gray from north carolina jack campbell from iowa uh demarvin and overshone from texas they're all right around that that spot where the giants pick maybe a little bit below that but um you know who, who knows that that's on uh, you know one board what, what's on one team's board is not all, not the same as what's on another team's board. So, um, but I can see them drafting a lot of positions in the second round, just about any any position except for offensive tackle and quarterback, uh, and probably running back too. But, um, but I, you know, I, I think a lot of things are in play there. Yeah, and and uh, as we put a bow on this position by position break, I will say so. At the end of this, I'll have we'll do we'll each make our picks at twenty five. But like so, I. I kind of am springing this on you. So just like, think about it as I'm rambling here about this last position. Uh, and that would be safety. Uh, and Brian branch visited the giants from Alabama. Um, obviously they have one Alabama safety on the roster, Xavier McKinney, even though he didn't play with Brian branch. Uh, Brian Dable has a ton of Alabama familiarity because he used to be the OC there and knows Nick Saban. Well, so, you know, maybe a possibility Brian branch at 25, he can play corner two. It looks like, uh, this Kuiper McShay mock draft has him going 32, which is really the f- because of the Dolphins had to give up their pick because of tampering. That's the first pick to the Steelers in round two. Uh, so he'd be there in this projection for the Giants at 25. Probably would not be there for their second round pick. Uh, in the big picture, the you know the as far as safety goes, obviously they're going to be investing in Xavier Mc. Well, they could certainly be investing in Xavier McKinney after the season. It's a contract year. He's been a very solid player for them. Um, Julian Love left for Seattle. We all know that they replace him with Bobby McCain, albeit only on a one-year deal. He perhaps is not a long-term solution for them. So maybe try to get a cost-controlled guy here uh, at the other safety spot. Um, cost-controlled meaning cheap rookie contract. Uh, Brian Branch, perhaps, right? Um, well, he's 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 a definite possibility. Um, certainly the 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 best and the really the only first round safety on the market. And again, that's a position of need after Julian Love leaves. Um, you know, I don't know. I think they like, like Jason Pinnock. I don't know if they trust him to be their starting safety for 17 games. If that's the, you know, that, that remains to be seen. Uh, Dane, Dane Belton obviously did not have a great rookie year. They did have two interceptions, but overall did not have a, a very good rookie year as the and the, the Giants were obviously not uh, happy with the way he was playing because they essentially benched him in the middle of the season. And Jason Pinnock took his job while Xavier McKinney was out. <coughs> so, um, you know, if they're going to go number one safety, it's going to be Brian Branch. Uh, and, you know, that could be a really good pick. Um, 
at, at that position um, because he he there's a very good chance that he's the best player on a big board for a team drafting at that position. Um, in in fact, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I'm getting very good at doing these uh, draft simulators. Uh, um, and the the one I'm doing is on the NFL mock draft database, which I've, I've found to be pretty good. Um, and they have the two best available players on the board after when you get to number 25 as Will Levis and the Giants aren't taking Will Levis and Brian Branch. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, it's very possible that, you know, and then the, the, the next two after that are Michael Mayer, tight end from Notre Dame. They're not taking a tight end from Notre Dame. And uh, Cancy, a defensive lineman from Pitt. Uh, I can't see them taking a defensive lineman. The, 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 the one, the, the next two guys are probably the most interesting that they might take are um, Zay Flowers and Osiris Torrance. Uh, those, to me, <coughs> to me, if the draft board fell the way this, this simulator is fell, you'd be choosing between Branch, Flowers, and I suppose Osiris Torrance. Um, who would you choose between those three? <laughs> between those three players or the 25th pick? Um, yeah. I would take uh, I would take Branch. You take Branch. Total shot in the dark. But... All right. Well, well I just yeah. think Flowers is more of a slot guy, and I get it. You know, you want to have slot. Guy, but again, you just drafted a guy in round two last year. Yeah. You know, so, um, I mean, and and there was a redundancy comment about obviously with Rondale Robinson. Oh, there's redundant with Kadarius Tony, but Kadarius Tony was a knucklehead. So like, you there was a reason why you were. Dra- you know, drafting, and he wasn't drafted by your regime. I mean, Wandale Robinson is a solid guy by all accounts, and then they and they, uh, he just he just got hurt, so this durability issue. But he was drafted by this regime, so uh, that's why I would say no to Flowers. And I think with Torrance, um, yeah, I don't know. I just think that you draft a center in the second round, and then you have Ben Bredesen be your left guard. Okay. That that sounds good to me. Is that is that your pick then? No, I, so the, the, well, so that I, I did. Uh, and, uh, you sprung this on me, and then I sprung that on you. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I, so if I, you want to make a different different pick, go ahead. Yeah. Um, right. So I think you know that kind of we put a bow there on all the we talked about all their positions they could address. So what will they do? Right. So uh, we don't know. But like I, I like them taking a cornerback at twenty five. And who knows how it falls, but I'm not going to copy the exact thing that Kuiper McShay had here with Deontay Banks. I will, t- and I will have them going with Emmanuel Forbes, who goes 22nd to the Ravens in this Kuiper McShay mock. So he could certainly be there at 25. He's from Mississippi State. He the the issue with him is he's uh, he's really slight, really thin. He's a 166. Uh, man, it would be. I would six, love to- six interceptions, returns for touchdowns is. <laughs> That's pretty impressive. Isn't that, isn't that a number with him? It is. And he picked up 14 passes in college. I'm reading the blurb here that they wrote about him. I, I had done, I had looked at his scouting report on NFL.com a little bit. Uh, and they do a really good job. Lance zero line. Um, he's one six. I would love to be one sixty six again. I, I don't think I've been one sixty six since like seventh grade. Um, but <laughs> this dude is somehow one sixty six. I mean, like third grade. <laughs> <laughs> he's six one one sixty six. So he has the length. I mean, obviously. Uh, the, the weight and stuff's going to be an issue potentially with like physicality and like, can he put on weight and is he going to get pushed around? But you know, you can't stretch guys in terms of making them taller or longer. You can put muscle on them. And, and so I think the, the guy runs a four, three, five he's, he's, so he has in t- terms of the 40 yard dash. So there's going to be questions about uh, bulk size being pushed around. They obviously we talked about it. They need a corner, but the length is, um, going to be, you know, it could be an asset in, in man coverage. And so um, that the Giants obviously want to play a lot of that. Um, how will he be against the run? That's going to be a question mark. But um, I, you know, I, I think that cornerbacks a reasonable prognostication and, and in the interest of not copying uh, what the Kuiper McShay there had with Deontay Banks, I'll go Emmanuel Forbes. Let's, I mean, I'm going to be f- totally transparent. I have not like sat and studied this guy's film. All right. But like <laughs> just reading about what we, we know about him uh, seems reasonable, I guess. Uh, that's sort of the caveat with everything with all these draft pre-draft conversations. Who you got? Uh, who do you have at 25? So while we were speaking, I just did another simulation. Uh, 
And in this simulation, Emmanuel Forbes is listed as the 33rd prospect on their board, uh, but he's also available in, in this simulation. He wasn't in the last one. Um, and in this simulation, Bijan Robinson is available, uh, which is what I would do, but I don't think the Giants are going to do it. I don't. Um, and Brian Branch comes up here again, and I think I would take Brian Branch um, if he's the best available player. You know, in these, these two simulations I just did, Will Levis and Bijan Robinson are the only two players ahead of him on the board in terms of talent. Um, and I think if he's if he's available. Um, and he's the best player on your board. I, I think you you take him. Um, you have two Alabama safeties uh, starting for you next season. I don't see anything wrong with that at all. Um, I like Alabama players. Um, so I, that that's what I would do if he, he's the guy available. Um, safeties aren't all that sexy anymore in terms of a, a first round pick. But I think if you know if, if this guy's clearly, which he seems to be the best safety uh, out there. Hey, if you can get the best any, at any position in the draft uh, with the 25th overall pick, I think you've done pretty well. Agreed. That's a great point. And we can wrap it up on that. We'll see what the Giants do do um, in a week, less than a week for the first round. Um, so obviously round one on uh, Thursday night, rounds two and three on Friday night and rounds four through seven on Saturday afternoon. Uh, I, sure, I sure wish we could spend another six weeks talking about the draft. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a weird one because, uh, you know, the Giants don't have a high pick. They're not in the market for a quarterback. And so, again, and they had the Barkley and Lawrence situations, most notably Barkley, hovering over the spring. So it's like eh, the draft has been kind of a eh, – be an afterthought, but again, it's really important for a team that still has a lot of roster holes that overachieve. I mean, let's be honest. If you look at what the Giants accomplished last year in terms of winning nine and a half games, in terms of making the divisional round, and then you look at like the objective talent of their roster, it doesn't match up. So, like, if you just take a harsh look at this team, like they Joe Shane needs to needs to do really well in this draft. So, um, Again, the margin is squeezed a little bit by trading away the third round pick. He doesn't have as many swings as last year, and so he doesn't have the swing at five and seven. I mean, it's a yeah. He's in a, he's in a, this is a tough draft for him. It'll, it'll be a good uh, a a good test for um, how how well he does building this team this year because it's obviously a pivotal a pivotal second year um, for him after you know that. And, you know, good for him. The bar is probably set higher than he expected, than anybody expected it to be because of what they did last year. But also a tough position for him. For sure. And so we'll be back here with you guys really that the first week of May. I mean, Monday, May 1st is right after all the dust settles on the draft and the and all the things with like UDFAs or whatever. But we'll, we'll, we'll do one of these the first week of May to wrap up the draft uh, and look ahead to – spring practices and stuff. I doubt anything will have changed with Dexter Lawrence and Saquon Barkley by then. Maybe Aaron Rodgers will be a jet finally by the first week of May. Not that we'll talk about that too much, but uh, so we'll see you guys back here uh, that first week of May coming out of the draft. Enjoy the draft. Uh, always, a, always a fun viewing experience for fans. I know, especially that Saturday afternoon, hanging out uh, used to be that long marathon day. Even when I was a kid, uh, no, no longer, not as long of a day, but still, you know, Certainly a fun experience for fans to see what their GM is going to do and a big, big draft, obviously, for Joe Shane. So in the meantime, uh, please like, subscribe, rate, review, follow us on all your uh, podcasting platforms. We will be back here with you guys um, certainly sooner rather than later. So in the meantime, uh, take care, everybody. Have a good one.